Coming up on this edition of Oliver North's Real American Heroes, Walt Fricke and giving a lift to her heroes. Welcome to this edition of Real American Heroes, brought to you by Fidelis Media. I'm Oliver North, and our guest today is Walt Fricke. He's a real American hero, decorated Army aviator, having flown hundreds of missions as a combat pilot with the 68th Assault Helicopter Company in Vietnam. Walt was awarded the Vietnam Cross of Gallantry with the Silver Star and Palm, two Bronze Stars, 21 Air Medals, and a Purple Heart. Since his retirement from General Motors, Walt has dedicated his life and resources to serving America's combat wounded through the founding and support of the Veterans Airlift Command. In addition to VAC, Walt's the lead pilot for the Salute to the Armed Forces VAC Tribute Wing Flight Demonstration Team, which performs at air shows throughout the U.S. in support of Veterans Airlift Command. My good friend, Walt Fricke, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ollie. It's great to see you. Well, take us back to before you got to Vietnam. Why did you want to fly? You know, my dad was a, a crew chief on C-47s in World War II, did the Normandy invasion, was shot down in Holland uh, at Market Garden. And uh, he, was a, he was a model airplane buff. He was a crew chief on an airplane. He came back, still built model airplanes, had a hobby shop. We had model airplanes around us growing up. And uh, we went out to the airport to, to fly the U-Control models in free flight. Uh, at about 12 years old, I noticed the real thing over on the other side of the airport. And I had to fly real airplanes. I lost interest in model airplanes almost immediately. And he said, uh, well, go on over there and see if you can get a job washing airplanes. So at 12 years old, I went over to the hangar and, and found a little business and said, can I wash your airplane in exchange for flying lessons? And he said, absolutely. So I started polishing airplanes, washing airplanes. I'd work 18 or 20 hours and go fly an hour. And and over the course of a couple of years, I, I uh, sold it on my 16th birthday, got my private license on my 17th. Well, not quite. I took up skydiving in between my 16th and 17th birthday and I broke my leg. Uh, on a jump before my birthday. So I was in a cast. I couldn't take my private check ride when I turned 17. I did a few months later once I got healed up. And I uh, couldn't wait for, uh, you know, graduated from high school at age 17 uh, in 1966. And and I couldn't wait to, uh, to go fly in the military. And I was afraid if I went to college for four years why the conflict in Vietnam would have gone down and I wouldn't have had the opportunity that I would have as an army helicopter pilot because they take you right out of high school to flight school. And I had to wait until I got to be 18 in order to enlist, but that's what I did. So, and it was just for the uh, pure joy of flying primarily. Uh, you know, looking back on it, we went to serve our country and, and you know, for the things we believed in at the top of communism. And, you know, all of that is true, more so in hindsight. When you're a kid, it's the adventure. You know, they get out of the nest and go accomplish something. And uh, that's what it was for me. So you go to Fort Rucker at 18? You were 18 when you got to Fort yes. Rucker? Yeah. And, and from Fort Rucker direct to Vietnam? That's correct. So tell us about your, your time in, in Vietnam. How were you wounded? Uh, well, I was wounded, uh, obviously, my last day there. Uh, so so <laughs> that'll be a short story. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I got to Vietnam, I was 19 years old, and I actually was back from Vietnam before I turned 20, because I just turned 19 uh, not too long before I, I went over there. But I uh, got to Vietnam uh, April Fool's Day uh, of uh, 1968 on April 1st, right after the Tet Offensive, and uh, flew uh, combat assaults with the 68th Assault Helicopter Company, flew slicks for about two and a half months. Then I transitioned to made aircraft commander, transitioned to what they call the Smokey smoke ship, which we'd smoke the LZ before the, the uh, and I liked that job because I got to fly 10 hours a day. I mean, when you're flying troops in and out, you'd go back and wait and take the next load in, go back and wait. Or same with kind of same thing with the gunships, but the smoke ship stayed on station all day. I relieved the command and control ship. He'd go to get, re you get refilled and I'd sort of be in charge of the ground operation as a 19 year old kid flying around in the smoke ship. So I loved it because I got to fly more. Then I transitioned to gunships after one particular long day in, in Smokey. I said, boss, I've earned it. I want to fly gunships. And he said, you have, you can, you're out of in the Mustang platoon starting tomorrow. And they'd already requested me. So off I went to fly gunships where uh, on my day off, I was flying with my platoon leader and uh, we were making a combat assault over by the Cambodian border with the 9th Infantry Division. 
which is a common group that we, we uh, uh, hauled. And um, we're making the prepping the LZ for the landing when, when a rocket uh, exploded coming out of the, out of the uh, tube while we were doing the uh, prep run. And uh, shrapnel came through the cockpit and severed my foot nearly. I mean, the Achilles tendon was, was still there, but my foot flipped around and landed in my lap and uh, sort of ended my tour in Vietnam. And they got me to a medevac to a hospital and, and shipped out of Vietnam. They managed to salvage my leg. Uh, if foot doesn't work, but it, it does. You know, it, it, my, I have no action in my ankle. You know, it's all kind of fused together, but uh, but I've, I've had this set of landing gear for 50 years since. And, <laughs> Your landing gear is always down. Yep, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, now just full, full disclosure, folks. Walt and I know each other pretty well. I've been with him at some of those air shows. I've been with him to see the remarkable things that Veterans Airlift Command does for our wounded veterans and their families. What motivated you to get started in this? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that I spent six months in the hospital a long way from home. As a young kid coming from a working class family in Northern Michigan, it was about six weeks after I was wounded. I was in the hospital in Japan for a couple of weeks then medevac back here and they tried to get you as close to home as you could if you didn't have like threatening kind of injuries. I returned from Vietnam on Veterans Day. I arrived at the hospital at Fort Knox. Uh, my family was 700 miles away without the resources, quite frankly, to come and see me until they could get time off work. Uh, and my, my fiance, now my bride of 52 years, uh, came down with them. And until they came, I was pretty much a basket case because I thought I was going to lose my leg. Didn't know if I was going to spill salvage my leg. And I was kind of going downhill emotionally. I wasn't eating, putting old food down. Probably PTSD going from, you know, eight months every day, fight or flight to bang, you're in the hospital. And so on one one hand, it was a good wind down because I was in the hospital with other GIs and, and you had time to kind of talk through. It's like the guys in World War II came home on the boats, had time to unwind and tell stories and unload a lot of this stuff, which, which that was helpful. But emotionally, from the standpoint of going forward, you know, I just had a lot of anxiety. And uh, once my family got there to see me, the healing switch was thrown and I started to get better immediately. They say the same old guy. I knew they knew I was the same old guy. So, so I started to heal. Well, fast forward to 2006, the hospitals were filling up from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I had an airplane retired from General Motors young and I had an airplane and I thought, you know, that problem that I had as a kid, getting my family there, getting home on convalescent leave, I could solve that for somebody with my airplane. And so I went to the VA and I started looking around for ways to find families that needed a lift to, to fly people. A friend of mine challenged me because I was running the, the foundation for General Motors. I'd started it, the, uh, the Home Ownership Preservation Foundation and built it to a this thing is still going well today. And a friend challenged me and said, you know how to do this. You need to stand up a national organization. You shouldn't keep this to yourself, which, you know, there's a lot of joy in doing it and actually picking up the veterans, flying with them, building a relationship with them, letting them know that uh, we love them and that somebody cares enough about them to provide their resources to take them home. And so I really wanted to do that, but I was torn because of the challenge my friend gave me. He said, you know, this is great that you can do this, but you really could stand up a national organization and share it with them. Well, now 2,600 volunteer pilots that fly for us. And we've flown 18,500 passengers. Um, I haven't flown but a couple missions in all this time because I was too busy when I started it doing the coordination. You know, I, so I stood the thing up myself, funded it myself and hired the people that I needed to hire to do the coordination. Uh, it's been a multiplier kind of a blessing where I don't get the direct, but I get a lot of indirect. And it's been life changing for the guys that fly for us. So I'd say, all in all, that was a good trade. And the wonderful thing about it is it doesn't cost those, these young soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines who are wounded, it doesn't cost them a penny. And you've got great pilots who fly them where they need to go, and in some cases, bringing the families to them because they're, they're near death in some cases. Right. You've changed lives. Right. Well, I, I want you to, to tell us how they, people can support you, and if you're a wounded veteran, okay, how to get in touch with you. Okay, if you're, if you're combat wounded and need travel for medical or other compassionate purposes, and other compassionate purposes can be, uh, it's difficult because I have prosthetics going through the TSA lines, which you don't have to do when you pri fly uh, privately. You go to our website, veteransairlift.org. It's just simple, veteransairlift.org. And there's a passenger tab 
you click on it and you put in a travel request and we will put a email out to 100 aviators, pilots with private airplanes around, you wrote a flight, we'll put out an email telling your story and say, here and here's what the need is. And somebody will pick it up and, and you know, 90% of the time we get people to pick up the flights and, and take them where they need to go and bring them back. You do amazing work. And if I remember right, it's, it's 95% of the money that's donated goes directly to support this kind of operation for those guys. It's not an enormous overhead, but it supports making sure that the young guys who are hurt, and sometimes gals, get the right. kind of lift that they need to get to the places where they got, where they got to go. Yeah, that's that's right. It's ninety five percent. We've never gone as we've never gone that. Far. It's ninety six percent actually. I'll say ninety five just to clear the hurdle. But it's been ninety six, ninety seven percent for fifteen years. Ali, we don't have an office. We work out of our homes. Right. We have the same staff. We've had the same staff for uh, let's see. I've been at it for fifteen years. Our executive director fourteen years. Our mission coordinators probably average between the two of them eight years. So one six, one ten, or one eight, uh, one nine. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but they're they're and they're wives or daughters of combat wounded veterans, two of whom who had actually used our service when they were wounded and came out and said, of all of the people that helped them, this is the one that they felt had the most impact, and they wanted to come to work for us, and and the timing was right, and we hired the wife. One's a once the wife of a of a special forces uh, sergeant major. And one is the wife of a retired combat, above the knee amputee uh, combat vet. Uh, these guys served together in the 173rd and their wives were good friends. So one recruited the second one after when we needed the second one. We have the same staff all these years, have not added staff, no bricks and mortar. Uh, we work from our iPads and laptops at home and we've kept the, purposely kept the overhead. It's actually, it, it hasn't moved. I mean, we, you know, we, we have modest raises for employees. We pay them fairly well because they're on 20, we're on 24 seven. We have a duty officer. Last week I was duty officer. Once a month, we have a week duty officer where the after hours between five o'clock at midnight and first thing in the morning, the duty officer picks up in weekends as well, all day on the weekends, all day from talk 6 a.m. till midnight, whenever we're awake. If someone pings us with a travel request or a pilot, who, pilots are professionals who time is of the essence they can't be calling up and us looking for a volunteer to wait till somebody gets back to them on monday if they have a breakdown in their airplane let's say to mechanical and they got to pick somebody up in three hours when they call they're going to get a, a response immediately and and the response will be don't worry about it you're off the hook we'll find somebody else thank you put it behind you and we'll go on we'll immediately put out another request and, and generally it's interesting those two hour window requests including on christmas eve we get picked up well, you know, the, the volunteers that support this endeavor are the same kind of people that we really need more of in America. And I'm, I'm just so pleased that you and I have gotten to know each other over. I know for a fact that it, sometimes it takes less than 10 minutes for a volunteer to pick up, you know, well, to agree to pick up at a certain place in time a wounded veteran. My definition of a, a hero, classical definition, is a person who puts themselves at risk for the benefit of others. That certainly defines who you are and the organization that you've built with Veterans Airlift Command. And I wanna thank you for taking time to join us today. Hopefully, you'll see some donations coming out of this. I'm sure you're gonna get some more contacts from the veterans. Give us that site again. Yeah, veteransairlift.org. There is a donate button on the website, but uh, you know we've been blessed with good financial support. Our aim, can I tell you this? Very quickly, our aim is to build an endowment that funds this thing beyond my retirement, which at 83, I plan to retire. And and so uh, and that's the current plan. It was 73, 10 years ago, but it's now 83. Uh, my, my plan is to retire and have a, an endowment funded or about two thirds of the way there uh, that will fund the overhead so that we don't have to spend one bit of energy or money on fundraising which is why why we've kept our overhead so low is we, we don't advertise, we don't spend any money. Uh, we've got good support, mostly from the people who fly for us. But most recently, our largest supporter is a, an organization called uh, the Car Donation Foundation and the Vehicles for Veterans. And they have become our largest supporter, which is general public funding that people donate their cars and uh, vehicles for veterans. And, and they become a very good source. But the idea is I don't want 
uh, succession management to be focused on raising money and paying their salary. I want them focused on our combat wounded veterans. And that's where a lot of nonprofits will lose the edge is when the visionary is gone and it becomes a job for somebody to pay their get their salaries paid by raising money, their customer then becomes the donor. Our customer, our client is the combat wounded veteran, always will be. You've helped a lot of them. Thank you for being a friend and for being with us today. Good to see you, Ali. Thank you. Friends, if Walt's story has given you hope or inspired you to be a better American, take time now to subscribe and comment and let me know. Until next time, remember, Semper Fidelis is more than a slogan for U.S. Marines. Always faithful is a way of life. Thank you.